uh, this morning uh, uh, meeting with the uh, DFAT uh, group, uh, they were asking me what are some of my challenges uh, as a uh, women president. And uh, I was jokingly saying one of my challenges is being short. <laughs> and uh, every time I stand in front of a lectern, you know, I have to make sure that uh, the audience can see my face because otherwise uh, they end up only seeing my, uh, the top of my head. So that's, uh, that's number one challenge. But uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak uh, this afternoon. And uh, I um, join you in acknowledging the presence of the uh, traditional leaders and the people who own this land and thank them for this opportunity to share. Uh, I'm not going to say too much. I'd rather uh, listen or respond to questions. Uh, I'm hoping that you will have questions to, to raise. Um, I want to just say a few words about my journey as a, as a, as a woman uh, into this position. <clears throat> you know, I come from a family of, uh, of 10 children and I'm number eight in the family. So obviously I wasn't a leader in the family because I was uh, very unimportant at the very bottom of the, of the heap. Uh, so lots of uh, my brothers and sisters were leader of the family. So uh, this is uh, definitely something I have to learn as a, as a teacher. Um, and as an educator, um, I want to say that uh, being a teacher is really a leader, uh, even though people like to say that you know, if you're in political office, then you're a leader. But if you're a teacher or a mother, you're not necessarily a leader. I consider those positions very important, uh, you know. And, uh, and um, I think um, as someone who, who came this far, I started learning about leadership uh, uh, being a mother. Uh, even though it's a small family, still you have to organize everything around uh, making sure that you have enough money, making sure that you have uh, uh, you're disciplining the kids like this one, and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, making sure you're on top of their uh, various uh, uh, um, plans to do otherwise. So, um, and being uh, coming from the Marshall Islands, well, I come from a matrilineal society, uh, as you all know. Um, there are lots of uh, uh, saying about the role of women in my culture. Uh, you know, there is, uh, there, they, there are so much compared to uh, roles of women in the, I mean men, in my culture. Uh, so um, it goes from uh, being the real mother for the family, the nurturer, to being the uh, uh, cheerleader as well for the, the, the men. <laughs> so it goes uh, uh, the old range of, uh, of, um, of roles for, for women. And I think uh, for us in the Marshall Islands, uh, women have naturally uh, been taken on leadership role because of the cultural expectation as well. Um, although when we look at the, the um, political leadership, we haven't really done that well. Uh, we've had, since our constitutional government, had one woman in our parliament until last year when we have now three. This is 38 years later, we have three women in our parliament. So I'm wondering whether we'll take another 38 years before we can have another three women or have, so we can have six women in our parliament. So it, it's not easy uh, for women to, uh, to get elected, as you all know, in uh, to political office. Um, there is the, um, the lack of uh, organization behind women to support their uh, running for office. Uh, as you all know, most of the political uh, groupings are, uh, or parties, if you, we don't really have uh, political parties in the marshals, but we have political grouping. And a lot of these are led by men. So if you're not part of the group, you know, you don't necessarily get the support of the political parties behind you. Uh, th there is the issue also of, um, of uh, resources. Uh, and especially self-confidence. I think these are the issues I see as uh, uh, impacting women's uh, getting into a leadership position, especially in the political arena. Uh, we have to be very confident. Uh, I sometimes talk to uh, my colleague, uh, women friends in the Marshall Islands, uh, to put their names out there. Because when, uh, during election time, uh, 
inevitably very few women would put their names out there. And again, it comes back to uh, confidence. Uh, many women don't want to put their names out there and then lose uh, election. They don't like that. So they want to make sure that they have a better chance before they put their names uh, in the rolls for election. So the more, the more women put their names out there, the more they can um, uh, have self-confidence or they can uh, take risks and uh, just put their name out there, I think the better chance for more women uh, to be elected. Uh, but again, uh, the network of women is important. The support of other women is very important in getting women into political position. Um, in the Marshall Islands, and I don't know elsewhere, but uh, a lot of women don't support other women running in or being in leadership position. It's uh, a lot of the time the women who are the one kind of uh, uh, pulling back on their friends uh, and uh, not helping them not supporting them to go forward. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. I think uh, a lot of awareness, a lot of uh, discussion on human rights, uh, the ability, the, the uh, because when you think about it, it really, it really comes down to social issues and, uh, and the ability of women uh, uh, to take part in political discussions, in decision making. Uh, it's the ability to see women as just, uh, uh, another group uh, that can um, then, that can take uh, part in discussion in leadership as well. So it's human rights. You know, where are the rights of the half of the population? I mean, we often ask that. Uh, so when you look at that, as opposed to uh, men versus women, I think it, it probably makes it easier uh, for women to get elected into uh, or for. So it's not us against them, but it's uh, you know it's the ability and. Uh, the, the need for um, women to take uh, part in, uh, in decision-making role as well. Um, so for me, I started out as a classroom teacher, as I said earlier, and uh, going into uh, um, Secretary of Education. Um, as a Secretary of Education, I realized that uh, um, um, the extent of your um, ability to make a difference is very limited because uh, the minister, the people in cabinet make the final decisions on where the resources go. Uh, as you know, you know, if you can put resources, if you can make a decision on where the resources go, you know, that's, uh, that's where the, uh, the strength is. And so uh, I decided to run for, minist uh, for politics because I want to be in a role where I can make a difference in terms of where the resources go in education and to make a decision, be able to make decision on how education is being uh, managed or direction that education will take. And so that's why I first ran for, uh, for politics. It wasn't to be in this position. Uh, but after four years of uh, being Minister of Education, there were some uh, political issues uh, coming into the new term or the last uh, election of our uh, leader. And uh, I found myself uh, being asked to take on this role. And um, it just, you know, I, I like to say that it, uh, I was at the right place at the right time mm -hmm. because I don't think I planned it. Uh, none, of the, uh, none of my friends uh, planned it. Uh, but uh, it happened. And a lot of things, I think, uh, in a small community like the Marshall Islands, uh, people know each other. Uh, they know about your background. They know about the responsibilities, the seriousness, the integrity. Everything like that is, uh, is open book uh, in a small community. So taking responsibilities uh, in my career as, uh, uh, as Secretary of Education or as Minister of Education, uh, I was able to uh, uh, do a lot of uh, change in the direction of our uh, of education in terms of the uh, creating a new policy uh, for a language a language policy for the Ministry of Education, uh, focusing on uh, ensuring that the native language is taught from uh, first grade all the way up to twelfth uh, uh, grade. Um, before the emphasis was on English, so we had to do some shifting there. Also, uh, during my tenure as uh, Minister of Education, we were able to pull out the uh, 
public school system from the Public Service Commission so that the agency can be autonomous and can hire uh, its own staff and uh, create their own salaries and everything that has to do with selecting your own uh, people as well as uh, managing their own budget. So that was a, that was a big uh, undertaking for the Ministry of Education at the time uh, because our budget, our constitution uh, uh, placed the uh, responsibility of hiring and uh, um, firing or, you know, um, promoting uh, on the Public Service Commission. So the ability to move that out of the Public Service Commission into an independent agency uh, took a lot of uh, lobbying and getting a lot of uh, support from our uh, male counterpart in Parliament and other uh, other leaders. Um, I think the fact that I uh, I know about education a little bit, and they could trust that uh, you know I had some ideas about uh, where to take education in the country. Uh, that comforted a lot of our leaders, and they were able to vote with us uh, and make that happen. So right now uh, we're moving in a I think in a much smoother uh, uh, direction, and uh, and the the education is uh, is moving. It's a lot of. Uh, areas to improve yet. We have a long way to go, but at least uh, it's easier for the, the ministry to run its uh, program, to select the people that they need to be, to work on teacher salaries and benefits, and uh, as well as uh, uh, other issues related to education. Thank you.